Hey guys, welcome to Presume Legal. This is Misha Janice. I'm an attorney licensed to practice in New York and Florida. Surprise, surprise. I've decided to cover Karen Reed. Um, I kind of want to use this as a learning and practice opportunity ahead of the Donna Adelson um, trial that we're going to be watching uh, this fall. So anyways, I've decided to uh, cover the Karen Reed case and how I'm going to cover it is a, uh, you know, sort of a summary format. Um, I can't promise that I'll be able to summarize it every single day. I, I'm going to attempt to do my best. The goal is to uh, watch the trial and pull out highlights top 10, top five highlights of each trial day as we go through them and post it on YouTube. And, um, and you know, we'll see, I'll see how I do. Who doesn't love a good challenge, right? So um, let's start. Karen Reed, day one was today, April 29th, 2024. And I am not going to go into the specifics of... Um, of everything that was done. Rather, I'm going to give some highlights that I felt, uh, things of things that I thought were important, um, or, you know, or the biggest questions that everybody was left, was left with. So, uh, we got opening statements today in general, the opening statements from the Commonwealth, it was all over the place. It was hard to follow, hard to understand. They named about, I wasn't counting, but it had to have been at least, I don't know, 30, 40 different people's names, people who will be testifying. I'm not sure if everybody who they mentioned will be testifying, but it was, it was very difficult to follow in my opinion. And I, the audio was bad as well. So that maybe had, you know, something to do with um, the difficulty that I had in following it, but I definitely had to pause and rewind multiple times. The theory of the Commonwealth's case, and I might slip up and say state at some point. Look, be gentle. I'm used to saying state. I'm in Florida and uh, we have the state here. Massachusetts is a Commonwealth. So the equivalent of their state prosecutor is the, the Commonwealth. So the theory of their case is that Karen Reed, who was the girlfriend of the deceased John O'Keefe, accidentally, either accidentally or intentionally, basically ran over him and left him to die in blizzard conditions. And he did die. The charges against Karen Reed are for second degree murder. And that's a killing with malice. So that's intentional. There's also a charge for manslaughter, which is unintentional killing. And then there's a third charge for leaving the scene of an accident that caused a death. So let's get through some of this. I'm not going to go over all the evidence. There are plenty of deep dives and awesome creators who have, who started following this case a lot longer than, than me. Oh, also, I should mention, this case is new to me. I I realize that there is a lot of public interest in this case, and there's a lot of background to this case. And from what I understand, there are additional cases and investigations that are going on as a result of this case. That's kind of all new to me. I, I've heard about it on the periphery, but I haven't done any deep dive. So a lot of the information that I heard um, in the opening statements, I was hearing for the very first time. So I think that's uh, a, an interesting point of view because I'm kind of going into it like a juror. I, I have no biases at this point and I, I don't know which way I'm leaning towards. I can tell you as a result of the opening statements, I believe the defense's opening statements was a lot more uh, persuasive and well put together. And as a result, I have a lot, there's a lot of questions that I feel 
<clears throat> the state is going to have to answer if they intend if they intend on proving the elements of the charges that they've uh, charged against uh, Karen Reed. So the first highlight <clears throat> is the question of the body. John O'Keefe's body was found in the front yard of an acquaintance of his, uh, the yard, the homeowner of the yard is, uh, the Albert family. The Albert family is a police family, I guess. They're well connected in the, in the police community in the city that, um, that this all went down in Canton, Massachusetts. Anyways, there hasn't been testimony yet. Well, actually there has been. Okay. So op from opening statements alone, the Commonwealth said that despite there being six inches of snow on the ground, when John's body was discovered, when John's body was removed from the ground, there was grass, there was no snow underneath his body. And that basically is supposed to mean that his body was there a long time. It was there before or soon after it started snowing. And there was a blizzard that night. So they're of the opinion that the body was there a lot longer than what the defense is, is, uh, is proposing. So that's the first one. The second one is... John was a no-show at the party. So this was an after party that he was invited to. John and Karen had been um, drinking at local bars that evening, and they met up with, with people that they knew. They got an invitation to the Albert's home, and we know that they drove to the Albert's home. The question is whether John went into the home. Did he actually leave Karen Reed's car? Did he go into the home or did he not go into the home? The state is saying that from their opening statements, the state is saying that he never got out of his car, that there were people inside the home that saw the car pull up, but that nobody saw him actually get out of the car. So they're trying to push uh, the idea that at some point, I guess, he got out of the car and Karen backed the car up onto him, running him over with the car. He hit his head and she just left him there to die in in the horrible weather that they were having. The defense says the opposite, that he went to the party and that something must have happened inside the party. Meanwhile, Karen went home. She did not go to the party. She didn't even get out of the car. I don't think that that is disputed uh, at this point. I haven't heard anything contrary to that from either side. I think it's uh, well known that she didn't go to the party. She didn't want to go. She went back to John's house where she was staying at night and she went to bed. The next highlight are the Google searches. So there's two sets of Google searches, I think, that will be at play here. The Commonwealth brought up the Google search that Karen asked, that the defendant asked uh, a friend of hers, Jennifer McCabe, to do when the defendant woke up and she realized that John was not home yet. Um, she called up her friend and they went out looking for him. They ended up going to the Albert house and that's where they found him. So it was, it was, uh, the defend, the defendant, Jennifer McCabe and uh, another woman that all went out searching. Um, when they found him there at the house, Allegedly, the defendant asked this other lady to search her phone, how long does death take from hypothermia? And that search was conducted at 623 
and 6.24 a.m. when they found John's body. There's another set of Google searches that the defense brought up in their opening statements. And those Google searches, they say, were done by Jennifer McCabe at two, about around 2.30 in the morning, hours before John's body was discovered. The defense's opening statement basically was that there was the party at the Albert's house. Jennifer McCabe was one of the people at the party inside the house, along with a bunch of other people. But something went down at the house. And when Jennifer McCabe left the party, went home before she went to sleep, before she, you know, went to bed, she Googled how long to die in the cold. And that was at 2.30 in the morning. This was before Karen Reed even realized that John hadn't come home. So the question is, why is somebody searching Google for, you know, making that query at that point in the morning? Like, that's not just something you do out of curiosity. Something must have spurred that, something that they must have seen or done or, you know, or, or heard about. So that's going to be some pivotal evidence, I believe, in this case. The next one is huh, the couple fighting. So there was evidence, actually, the, uh, the second witness to take the stand, who was John's sister-in-law. She testified and uh, the Commonwealth said in their opening statements that the couple were, they were on the fritz. They argued, they screamed. Um, there was a trip to Aruba, a family trip to Aruba, during which John and Karen were seen arguing with each other, fighting. Aaron, I think. Aaron O'Keefe, who is John's sister-in-law, she took the stand. She was the second witness. She gave a lot of background on the family, but she said that Karen and she were very good friends and Karen confided in her that, you know, they were arguing and they had argued the morning of the day that the incident happened much earlier in that day. There, were, there was an argument about taking, taking John's niece to Dunkin' Donuts, I think before school, something like that. Some, it seemed like something pretty small, but it was something that, you know, a couple would fight over, I guess. It wasn't anything huge, but uh, defense counsel was basically like, okay, so they argued like what couple doesn't argue at some point. But the fact is there was never any domestic violence between them. There were never any complaints or allegations of either of them laying hands on the other. So, you know, an argument doesn't make a motive for a murder and that it would just be ludicrous for Karen Reed all of a sudden out of the blue to become like this murdering woman when there's been no evidence of any violence in her past. Okay, next is the car tail light evidence. So the Commonwealth, they were listing all the people that they're going to have come testify. And one of the witnesses is going to present some DNA samples from taken from, allegedly taken from the tail light of Karen Reed's car. Um, this tail light was busted out, but the big question is, when was it busted out? That is going to be a, a, a pivotal question. They're saying that it was busted out when she ran over John, basically. And the defense is saying that it wasn't, the tail light was intact. Tail light was intact. The defense is basically saying that there were no pieces of the tail light found at the time when they found John when they found John's body. So after John's body was taken from the scene and taken to the hospital to attempt to revive him, there were officers on the scene and they were looking for evidence and nobody saw any pieces of taillight 
Nobody saw shards of, you know, that colored plastic, whatever color it is, red or whatever. And after some time, after it had been snowing, then there were pieces of taillight that started to be found. This was after Karen Reed's car was taken into possession by the police, by the state police. Once they had her car in possession, in custody, more taillight pieces kept appearing in the Albert's yard. Taillight pieces kept appearing until February 18th, or which is basically three weeks after John's death. And some old guy who was a friend of the Alberts, somebody who, I don't know, they made it kind of seem like he was blind or his sight couldn't be trusted. Even that guy said that he found some taillight pieces as well. So it's very questionable uh, where these taillight pieces came from and when they started appearing and how they came to just seem to multiply, not at the time when they would normally be found if they were, you know, a part of an, an accident, if they were part of a crime scene, but they were found after the fact, after getting custody of the vehicle that they were from. So that's also going to be some pivotal evidence to keep an eye out for. Next, we go into the investigation and all the omissions that were done. So after John was declared deceased and the police started to do their work, um, it became apparent that there were some really shady things that were happening. And this is from the defense's opening statement. There were a lot of shady things going on. First of all, John's body was found in the front yard of Brian Albert and the Albert family. Brian Albert is a, I don't know if he's an EMT or I think he's an EMT. Anyway, Brian Albert is buddies with the, the police in the community. Uh, Brian's brother is a Canton police officer. His name is Kevin. So Brian owned the home, but Kevin is Brian's brother. So the Alberts were very close to the, um, the police community in the city. Brian was also an EMT worker, I, I think. Um, but despite all the commotion going on outside his home in those early hour, early morning hours, he never came outside. He never opened his door. He never investigated. He never came out to see what was going on. He never came out to, you know, to speak to anybody, to find out, you know, why are these people that I know? at my house. <laughs> What's going on? You know, 20 feet away from my front door. So that was just very, very suspicious. I mean, how many of you would have something going on in your front yard and you not come out? Okay. So that was suspicious. It's also suspicious that the police investigating, they didn't go up to the house. No, they didn't go up to the house. They didn't knock on the door. They didn't see, you know, see who lived there. I think they knew who lived there. They didn't try and go inside the house. They didn't even ask to go inside the house. So there was no, you know, crime scene investigation, no dusting for prints, no looking for a scuffle or looking for signs of, you know, disturbances, nothing, none of that. They also didn't follow up with witnesses. Um, and we'll see that because they brought in they brought in the state police because of the closeness of um, the Canton police to the homeowner that was a conflict of interest. So they brought in the Massachusetts state state police to take over the case to get rid of the conflict of interest, but there was still a conflict of interest because the lead state detective, whose name is Michael Proctor, he was a shady one. 
He was a very, very shady one. And this is going to be so good when he testifies. And I hope he does testify. I don't see how he could not testify as the lead detective in the case. That would be absurd for him not to testify. And I don't see how the Commonwealth could um, could put on their case without without having him testify. But anyways, I, I look forward to seeing that, um, that cross-examination go down. And if the state, if the Commonwealth does not call him because he has, he has issues, there are definitely issues. I hope that the defense calls him and, um, and we see what he has to say. I'd like to put a face to the name too. Anyways, Michael Proctor has deep ties with the Albert family. Yes. The family of the home owner uh, where John O'Keefe's body was found is like his second family. He played a role at an Albert family wedding. He sat at the head family table at that wedding. Very, very close. Very, very chummy. And not only is that, but he's very inappropriate because shockingly, he... um. He divulged information to a group chat, a private group chat of um, himself and some buddies of his on his personal cell phone. He decided to let them know about the investigation, about the death of John O'Keefe. He, uh, he let them know about what was going on with the investigation, which is a huge no-no. He seized and he searched Karen Reed's phone. What was he looking for? He told his buddies he was looking for nudes. Nudes of Karen on the phone. He didn't find any. But he didn't have a search warrant for that phone. So why is he looking through a phone that he has no um, no right to look through? So one of his buddies on that group chat when Michael told them about, you know, the investigation, what was going on, one of his buddies said that whose ever house the body was found at, man, the homeowner's going to be under a lot of scrutiny, huh? Sucks for them. You know what Michael said? He said, nope. Nope. Because they're cops too. So this is what we're dealing with with the lead state detective. And I said, this is what we're dealing with. Like I'm a, (laughs) like, like I'm on the defense team, but I mean, my goodness, their opening statement was like drops. We know where they stand and we know what they, what they think they can, you know, they can show. Obviously they don't have to prove anything, but I don't think that they would be making allegations like this unless they had the proof to back it up. So that's the lead state detective behind the case. The next highlighted thing is the search warrants. I already mentioned how Proctor didn't have a search warrant to look for nudes, look for boob pictures of Karen Reed and her cell phone. He did apply for a search warrant for her car, though. In defense's opening statement, they said that um, he falsified that search warrant application. He falsified the time, the timing, the timing of when they took possession of of her car. Why would he falsify that? According to the defense, they implied that because Proctor took custody of Karen Reed's car before the time that Proctor put on the search warrant, they had possession of the car. It gave them ample time to, I don't know, bust some taillights out, collect some shards of taillight, which could then be planted. That's insinuation that I got. And look, this is the first time that I'm hearing, you know, the facts laid out like this. Obviously, opening statements, nothing, you know, being said by the attorneys is um, is testimony, but Wow, what what the defense counsel said is compelling, to say the least. And I can't wait to hear from more. I can't wait to hear more. 
two more. So there was a witness, the snowplow driver. There was a snowplow driver who was driving around Canton the night of the blizzard, trying to clear the roads. And um, his name was Brian Lawfren. He's interviewed by the defense because the Commonwealth, they, um, I don't know if they either made it up that they contacted him, but they reported that there was no snowplows that night. And it wasn't followed up any further. They just took that as a truth. But the defense went out. They found the snowplow driver. They interviewed him. And the snowplow driver, Brian, he was driving Frankenstein that night. That's the name of the plow. I thought that was kind of cute. So he was driving Frankenstein. He drove past the Albert's house at 2.30 a.m. And he was being very careful, looking on both sides in front of him making sure that there wouldn't be any obstructions. He didn't see John on the lawn at 2.30 a.m. He wasn't there. At 3.30 a.m., Brian made another go around down the street past the Albert house again. What did he see at 3.30 a.m.? He saw a Ford Edge parked at the Albert house, parked in the spot where John's body was found later on, later that morning. That's his testimony. John's body wasn't there at 2.30 a.m. And at 3.30 a.m., he saw a Ford Edge. Defense counsel said that a Ford Edge car is a car that belongs to the Albert family. So if we're connecting dots, putting pieces together, the insinuation is that, I don't know, they were doing something with the body then moving the body out there in the car or, or covering something up, trying to obscure view. I don't know. I think they'll put that together though, during the case. And the last point is Chloe, the dog. When John's body was found, he didn't look like he was hit by a car. The defense is going to have a forensic pathologist testify who will testify that John's right arm was injured and it had scratches and claw marks and bite marks consistent with a dog attack. The Alberts had a dog. Their dog was a German shepherd named Chloe. Chloe didn't like strangers, didn't do so well around strangers. John was a stranger to Chloe. He had never been to the house before. In April of 2022, there was a grand jury and uh, Brian Albert, the homeowner, testified in that grand jury, testified about Chloe. And after that grand jury, um, Chloe, Chloe was no more. They got rid of Chloe. So what does Chloe know? So what could have happened? I don't know. What happened that night? I don't know. It wasn't good. It left John Den and it left Karen Reed, somebody with no police affiliations, no ties to the, to the Leo community in a quandary. I'm looking forward to this case. I'm looking forward to, um, to talking about it with you guys and seeing where we can land. <laughs> so that's all I have for you tonight. I will be back tomorrow, hopefully, and the next day with some more commentary, some more highlights from the testimony. But until the next drop, peace. <laughs>